Uh, if you didn't hear the announcement out um, by the tables, next Wednesday, we're going to do one more potluck, and it's going to be a Christmas-themed potluck. So I hope you can come to that. And that'll be our last potluck of the year. So that's on the 20th. And on the 27th, we won't be meeting for Wednesday nights. Um, let's pray before we jump in, and then uh, we'll look at God's Word together. Father, as we come to your Word, we pray that you'd help us uh, read and understand. Help us have a desire. Help us have a hunger for this. Um, we know that in Christ Jesus, because of what he's done on the cross, that we've been forgiven. Anyone who's believed in you and asked for that forgiveness has been forgiven, has been forgiven. And uh, based on that forgiveness, we know we can come to you uh, with open hearts. We can be taught from your word. We can learn and grow as you work in our hearts, as you change us. So we pray for your help tonight. We pray that you would help us change, that you'd help us grow, uh, that you'd help us study tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before we turn to our passage, there's another passage I wanted to turn to. Um, before we turn to the passage, I have some questions for children, if you're under 10. Okay, if you are under, if you are, yes, under 10, uh, can you tell me the four Gospels in the Bible? Do you remember the four Gospels? Owen? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then another kid, can you tell me, or the same kid, but it's, it's still under 10, uh, what are the Gospels about? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what do they talk about? Jesus, good answer. Yes. <laughs> good answer. Yeah, the life of Jesus. And um, what, are, what's, what are some of the big things that happen in the Gospels? Like, what does Jesus do? Okay, anybody can answer this. He was born. What else? He heals. What else? He died. Right. And that's, that's the one I wanted to talk about tonight, right? That's so important for us that he died on the cross uh, so that we could be forgiven. So turn in your Bibles to the fourth gospel, John. Uh, I mentioned this last week, but we didn't turn there. And then there was some, some confusion afterwards. Uh, so I just wanted to turn together to, to John chapter 19. If you remember last week, we studied Zechariah 12. And one of the things that Zechariah mentions is that when the Messiah comes back at the end of times and uh, Israel looks on him, they begin to mourn and weep and repent because they realize a giant mistake that they've made. And the giant mistake is that they've pierced him. So it says they look on him whom they have pierced. Well, John quotes that. So if you look at John 19, starting in verse 31, it says, since it was the day of preparation, this is at the end of the crucifixion, the end of his time on the cross. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. So, what's happening there? What is he talking about? Crickets. Suspense. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it, Jonathan. Right. I, I totally agree. So he quotes, he quotes a verse that says, they will look on him whom they pierced. And that sounds a little confusing at first because it sounds like they could be talking about like the people who are watching the crucifixion 
are looking on him whom they've pierced. And it sounds like that's fulfilling um, Zechariah 12. But Zechariah 12 wasn't talking about that, right? Zechariah 12 is talking about another time they're looking at Jesus, but they're looking on him whom they have pierced. And so just wanted to clear this up that uh, it's, what seems to be happening is that John is telling us something really startling. And he believes it's startling because you look again at verse 35. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth that you may also believe. So he's saying over and over, you know, I saw this. I really saw this. You, you got to believe me. I saw this. And what he's lining up are some ideas from the Old Testament of how it would make sense for the Messiah to die. And one of them he takes um, from... Uh, probably, if I remember right, not one of his bones will be broken, um, talking about the sacrifice of the lamb, how the, the, lamb, the lamb's bones were not meant to be broken. Um, somebody correct me if I got the wrong reference on that. The second one is they will look on him whom they have pierced. And so I think John, what he's saying is this is how it would make sense for the Messiah to die, that his bones wouldn't be broken and that he would be pierced and said because there's this future time where they're going to look on the one that they pierced. Uh, and so even though the other guys that are being crucified, their bones are broken and they're not pierced in the side, for Jesus, the circumstances just kind of uh, happen perfectly, exactly how you'd expect it, that he, his bones were not broken and he was pierced. And John is pointing out that startling reality that this would happen exactly how you'd expect it for this sacrifice. Any questions about that? It, Jonathan? It could be the hands and feet, too. Those are pierced as well. And I don't think it specifies. Um, but the most recent piercing is the piercing of the side. So I say all that just to say that when he quotes the Zechariah passage, the point isn't that it's being fulfilled, that they're looking on him, the one that they've pierced, although they are looking on him. Um, the point is that he needed to be pierced. If in a future day at the end times they're going to look on the one that they pierced, at some point he had to be pierced. And John is saying that happened, that was fulfilled. We knew he had to be pierced, and lo and behold, the Messiah was pierced. Paul? In what, what, what way? Yeah. Like, um, like pierced to the heart? Is that what you mean? Or? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, maybe. I've always, um, by the time you're going through Zechariah, you already have Isaiah, right? You already have him being crushed for our iniquities and pierced for our transgressions. In Zechariah 12, we added to that that they're going to look on the one that they have, the one that they have pierced. And so I think there is this expectation that when Messiah comes, he will have, when Messiah comes to conquer, he will have already been, I read it as physically pierced. Uh, like actually pierced. So when he comes at the end, they're going to look on the one that they have already pierced, that the Jews have already pierced. And I think John is saying, that just happened. He just got pierced. Either the nails or the stabbing in the side. So, Oh. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Right. Yeah, I do think it's more of a corporate thing um, that it's Israel looking on the Messiah, and it was Israel who had crucified the Messiah. Um, it's a good point. Okay. So you're saying if he was pierced in the future, when it would come, you're saying it's not fulfilled yet. It's still not fulfilled. Right. So, and that was the confusion at the end of last time. That's what I wanted to clear up is uh, it can sound, this is how I read the Gospels when I was a kid, that they will look on him whom they have pierced. I thought it was a direct prophecy about uh, like the people standing there looking at Jesus. Um, but if you go back to Zechariah 12, like we did last week, we see, well, no, that's an end times prophecy that they're going to look on the one that was pierced. And um, 
so at some point he had to be pierced, and John was saying that that happened. Yeah, Noah? Yeah. Yeah, true. Right. And I think that is, it is the context, especially when you're adding it with the bones. You know, I think it's clear he's, he's talking about the manner in which the Messiah needed to die, and it happened just like it needed to. Well, let's turn back to Zechariah now. Um, most, you know, as we've gone through Zechariah, we're going to be in chapter 13 today. As we've gone through Zechariah, there's been this astonishing amount of specific prophecy about Jesus Christ in his first coming. Uh, we've seen the 30 pieces of silver. We've seen uh, other, other acts about who he is, the, the priest and the crown and, and uh, other things like that. Uh, we're going to see another one of those today. Um, most of what we're covering, though, in this section in Zechariah 12 through 14, most is about the end times. Um, as you read it, it's very clear. He's talking about the day of the Lord, the, the last day of the Lord, when the Lord comes to battle. And if this has been a conversation that uh, you've gotten a little lost in and, and you just can't remember uh, how the scriptures lay out some of the end times things or you don't remember some of the passages and you were looking for books to put on your Christmas wish list, uh, I have a couple for you uh, to recommend. Um, the first one is called Christ's Prophetic Plans. And this is by a whole bunch of authors. Uh, it's like a different author every chapter. But it just walks through a lot of what the scriptures say uh, about the end times. It kind of adds a lot of passages together. It helps you. Um, it, it has a great, simple uh, layout and, and timeline at the beginning. It doesn't go crazy with the timeline. Uh, but it's just a helpful kind of skeleton book to help you understand a lot about the end times and how to read end times passages. Um, another one, and this one's a little more uh, detailed. This one's just called The End. It looks very dramatic, I know. Uh, and the, the author's name is Hitchcock, Mark Hitchcock. So it feels dramatic. Um, but uh, it's just really good. He just goes through, and um, every chapter is a different part of the end times, and he just kind of collects a whole bunch of passages about that and really tells the story. And he's a gifted author. So I recommend these two um, uh, to you, if you want to brush up on it, uh, or if you're just feeling totally lost, um, these resources can help. There are others too, so so if you want more suggestions for resources, I can give them. But turn to Zechariah 13. We've been talking about how in this last day, all these nations will have gathered around Israel. So there's still a remnant of Israel there. And all these nations have, have gathered against them. That was Zechariah 12, um, verse 3. On that day I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves, and all the nations of the earth will gather against it. So Jerusalem is, is inhabited, and Israelites live there. And it's this, this terrible time in the last days where every single nation has sent people to gather against and wage war against Jerusalem. So it's, it's the whole world versus the Israelites. And we'll see in, in chapter 14 that it, it's not going well. The Israelites are being crushed. Many of them have been killed. Uh, this is a, a judgment on, on Israel it, itself. Uh, and then the Messiah comes to rescue them, the people who are left over. So we'll get more detail in, in chapter 14. But in chapter 13, uh, we are continuing the story that we had in chapter 12. So the Messiah comes, they look on him, they realize that he's the one that they pierced. Uh, God said uh, back in verse 10 of chapter 12, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, and that's God speaking, when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly as one weeps over a firstborn. And then it goes on to, to explain how everyone at every level is mourning. The whole nation is mourning. And we see this repentance. And as a response to that repentance, look at verse 1 of chapter 13. 
on that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. What do you think is happening there? On that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. Right. I think so. He, you know, there, there is another way to take that. Uh, there are other passages we hear about, about uh, a real physical fountain of living water springing up in Jerusalem when the geography is changed, when Messiah comes back. Uh, so it could be a reference to that, and he, he mentions to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness because they'll use that fountain with helping with their sacrifices and, and things like that. So you, you can relate it to some of those other passages, but it seems more likely that what's happening here is that there has been this deep repentance, that the Lord has poured out his spirit of grace and um, caused them to cry out for mercy. He's caused them to weep in repentance. And, and as a result of that, they believe in him. They look on him, whom they have pierced, and there is a, a fountain open, a figurative, just like when we sing, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. It's that same kind of picture, a fountain, uh, free forgiveness for them when they repent, for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. So they see the Messiah, he returns, they realize their mistake, they repent, and as a result, this, this free uh, forgiveness is given to them. They're cleansed from their sin and uncleanness. <clears throat> Verse 2, and on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, see if you can figure out what's going on here. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land so that they shall be remembered no more. And also I will remove from the land the prophets and the spirit of uncleanness. And if anyone again prophesies, his father and mother who bore him will say to him, you shall not live, for you speak lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who bore him shall pierce him through when he prophesies. On that day, every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. He will not put on a hairy cloak in order to deceive. But he will say, I am no prophet. I am a worker of the soil, for a man sold me in my youth. And if one asks him, what are these wounds on your back? He will say, the wounds I received in the house of my friends. So what's happening here? What's the big idea of this passage? Yeah. Yeah. Right. He is he's working in them. Now, what else is going on? What else did you see in the passage before I keep going? Jonathan? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, part of the law that they've never really been fastidious about. You know, they've never really applied this to the full extent. Now they're, they're just, to the letter, obeying the Lord. It's as if the law was written on their hearts, you could say. Uh, what else? Anything else you observe in the passage? Right. And it's like a community judgment. They're doing what they're supposed to, right? They're, they're doing what they're supposed to and not allowing for there to be these false prophets. So if we're backing up for a, uh, for a minute to a big picture and we're considering, again, the new covenant that we read about in Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31 and Isaiah 59 and, and all these other places about when the Lord is going to pour out his spirit on a generation of Israel, um, it talks about how that the Spirit is going to be poured out and they're going to be changed. Their hearts are going to be changed. They're going to want to obey. The law is going to be written on their hearts. Um, the Lord is going to change them. And in Zechariah, what we see happening is exactly that. The Lord comes back. The Messiah comes and is fighting for his people. But at the same time, uh, 
the Spirit has impacted their life, and they've changed. They repent, they are forgiven, they're cleansed, and now uh, they don't even want anything to do with the old sins that they had. So idolatry is just totally gone. They don't even remember the names of the idols. Um, Verse 2, on that day, uh, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land so that they shall be remembered no more. Also, I will remove from the land the prophets and the spirit of uncleanness. Uh, maybe some kind of prophetic uh, evil spirit or unclean spirit or demonic spirit um, that would influence the false prophets. The Lord's saying all that's gone, all the idolatry is gone, all the false prophecy is gone. And it's so much gone that if someone pretends to be a prophet and it's not true, that the people's righteousness and desire to please the Lord is going to be so high that it's higher than family ties. You know, look again at verse 3. It's shocking. If anyone again prophesies, his father and mother who bore him will say to him, you shall not live, for you speak lies in the name of the Lord, and his father and mother who bore him shall pierce him through when he prophesies. You know, they are... They love the Lord so much and they are so committed to, to obeying his law in this generation that uh, they're willing to do this even to their own son. You can see the picture that this just doesn't happen anymore. Nobody wants to be a false prophet anymore in this generation because they know that kind of thing will happen. So verse 4, on that day, every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. He will not put on a hairy cloak in order to deceive. Um, I think that's probably something like the prophetic mantle like Elijah wore uh, or uh, technically the the only other time we hear the phrase hairy cloak uh, is, well, can you think of a story with a hairy cloak? Right, Jacob and Esau, remember Esau was hairy and Jacob puts on the hairy cloak in order to deceive. So it might be connected to that. Um, But the point is, Prophets used to do this kind of thing. They used to deceive. They used to be fine with giving false visions. Now they do not want anyone to think that they have ever done that, not even their own parents. Uh, They just don't want anybody to think that. And so verse 5, he will say, I am no prophet. I'm a worker of the soil, for a man sold me in my youth. He's trying to explain his background. He's coming up with his stuff. You know, know, that's not me. You're thinking of somebody else. I'm I'm not a prophet. I've never been a prophet. Um, I'm a worker of the soil. In verse 6, if one asks him, what are these wounds on your back? He will say, the wounds I received in the house of my friends. I think that's just, he's scrambling. It's the lamest excuse ever. You know, why would, what kind of friends would give you wounds on your back? And I think the wounds here are are referring to some kind of idolatrous practice of false prophecy. uh, You know, just like the prophets of Baal. You remember they used to wound themselves. So I think it must be tied to the same topic. And you could tell a false prophet because he's got these, wounds on his back and and the guy's trying to say no 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 you know my buddy did this to me you know just uh, you can just tell it's this scramble to get away from any idea of ever have been ever have being taken place yes um uh, you know that they don't want to be associated with it (laughs) i couldn't figure out how to say it the other way they don't want to be associated with it at all they're just scrambling for these excuses all right, any, any questions so far? <clears throat> yeah, so this is, that's a tricky question, right? So in chapter 12, what we've seen so far are really kind of these vignettes that are a little bit topical about some end times things. They're not quite in order, and and we we talked about this last week, how it seems like some of the ones that came later in the chapter might precede the ones that came earlier in the chapter. He keeps kind of resetting the context by saying, on that day. Uh, So I think we're to assume that it's all around that end times uh, period, and that we're to assume that it's, it's kicked off by the Messiah's return. But some of the things that um, that take place lead to, so like, for example, I think verse 2, on that day, I'll cut off the names of the idols from the land. I think that's happening when he returns and changes their hearts. And then the rest of 3 through 6 is the consequences of that as they enter the millennium, as they have this perfect society on the holy mountain uh, under the Messiah's reign. 
that this is the attitude that's theirs. They, they just want to be so done with all this stuff. Does that kind of make sense? Could be. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to see some connections with that too, with the uh, population that's left and things like that. We'll see some similarities with the numbers in Revelation. I think that when we get to chapter 14, the, uh, the chronology will be a little clearer there. I think in 12, we've seen these kind of topical vignettes that uh, jump around just a little bit on the timing. So it's a, a little hard to determine uh, You know, like we talked about three or four weeks ago, some of the prophetic passages are clearly meant to give this chronological timeline. uh, And then others are just saying these different things that are happening. And I think chapter 12 and 13 is is more like this one. These are different things that are happening in end times. Um, And we might see a little more chronology in, in chapter 14. What else? Any other questions? All right, well, we have a break from the topic. Look at verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. Pause there. So we have this interjection that's not really the same as, as the rest of what's been happening. Uh, the rest of what's been happening is on that day in the future, this will happen. And on that day, this will happen. And on that day, this will happen. But then we have a break from that pattern. And we have this inter- interjection of a quotation about um, God speaking, saying, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me. Or uh, another way to say that is like against the one who's on my side, uh, on my team, my partner, my associate. uh. What does that make you think of? What does verse 7 make you think of? Right? Yeah, this verse is quoted. Uh, on that last night when Jesus tells them that they're all going to abandon him. And the way he knows that is he quotes a passage about how the shepherd's going to be struck and the sheep are going to be scattered. Okay, so that's one thing to keep in mind. What else does it make you think of? Right. You remember Zechariah 11? Uh, If y'all were here for that. Zechariah 11, one of the big prophecies in that was that Zechariah was to act out being a shepherd. And he was supposed to do it twice. There was a good shepherd that was rejected by the sheep. Uh, And then later he took up the equipment of a shepherd again and he was a foolish shepherd. You remember that? And the good shepherd was the Messiah uh, who was going to be rejected by his people when he came. And then the foolish shepherd, we we decided, uh, if you agreed with me, that that was the Antichrist, uh, the pretender, the one pretending to be Messiah. So it seems to me that seven, awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, the one who's on my team, you know, the one that's with me, uh, declares the Lord of hosts. He's talking about this one. He's talking about this shepherd who is going to come, and the Lord is saying uh, he's going to be attacked. The good one. Right, awake, because it's God's shepherd, the one who's with him, his associate, his partner. Uh, strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. So uh, it does seem like an interjection. Uh, I think it matches the context because 
he's explaining more. Number one, he's already brought up the idea of the shepherd in chapter 11 in the last oracle. Uh, Number two, now he's adding this idea that this individual who's coming is going to be pierced. And so this is a call for as all these amazing things are happening in the life of Israel, what's going to allow that to happen? What's going to provide the ability for that to happen? And that's the, the piercing of this shepherd, uh, the, the shepherd being attacked uh, and struck, even though it's going to scatter the sheep. So uh, maybe you've uh, studied something different on this verse, but I would take this as a direct prophecy about the Messiah that Uh, This good shepherd who's coming is going to be struck. And when he's struck, all of his disciples are going to be scattered. Um, And I will turn my hand against the little ones. I would take that as the the judgment that then came on the Israelites and um, afterwards um, with the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem and and things like that. Any thoughts on that? Any other positions you might have heard or... Um, thought through. Yeah, and and some would say that it, it's even just limited to the disciples. Um, the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. I I tend to think that it's the non-believers, um, as the sheep are scattered, and then the Lord in response is going to judge Israel with the sacking of the temple and the judgment. But it could be an expression of the Lord's sovereignty, even against his own, the 12, uh, or something like that, as they go through trials. What else? Any other thoughts or questions? Well, he goes right back to it in verse 8. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. And they will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people and they will say, the Lord is my God. What do you think is happening there in eight and nine? What is he talking about? I know this is a tricky chapter. For, uh, in, well, probably not. Um, what else? Any other ideas? But it was a good answer, Lily. So. Yeah. Noah? Yeah. What else? I think, you know, he's, he's in this end times. I kind of lost my train of thought a little bit there. Um, but he's in this end times period where, again, it's not going to go well. You know, if you just look over at chapter 14, uh, 2, I'll gather all the nations against Jerusalem to the battle and the city shall be taken. And the house is plundered and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. You know, it, it's, it's very much not going well for them that they're experiencing this judgment, but there are some left. And those, that remnant that's left uh, also is going through this trial and gets purified. So um, this last one, test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. So that testing, as gold is being tested, that's not a pleasant thing, right? We see that elsewhere in Scripture, too. Tested as gold and silver, that's not an a enjoyable experience. How, how are gold and silver tested? Right. Right. All the, all the terrible, you know, it's not fun. And they'll melt it down, and they'll blast up the furnace fire, and they'll... You know, get all the impurities out. Um, 
All of that is making it more pure and cleaner, uh, but it's not pleasant. And that's what the Lord is saying to them, that the, he's going to put them through this. As a result, he's changing them. He's changing their heart. Uh, he's turning them into people who will say, the Lord is my God, and he will say, they are my people. Yes. All right, so just getting us back on track, because I lost my train of thought a little bit, and maybe you did too. Um, we're in this end times time. He, he's talked several times about how the Messiah is coming back, and they're going to repent, they're going to be changed. And now, even through this, this terrible time of suffering, they're going to be purified. They're going to call out to the Lord. He's changing his people. So look, look over at chapter 14. We'll just barely dip into chapter 14. Um, I have a quote for you about chapter 14. I'll read it again next week probably, but um, listen to this quote. This is Martin Luther as he's trying to decipher Zechariah 14. Here's what he says in his commentary. Here in this chapter, I give up. uh, For I am not sure what the prophet is talking about. So there you go. That's Martin Luther's commentary on Zechariah 14. Uh, Here in this chapter, I give up, for I'm not sure what the prophet is talking about. Um, So, you know, if if you have been struggling as we've been stepping through Zechariah, you're not alone. Um, What Martin Luther would go on to do, and the reason why I think it was so difficult for him, is because, remember, he's he's operating under this uh, understanding that the church has replaced Israel And so all of the promises that were meant to go to Israel are supposed to go to the church. And so the way he's trying to interpret Zechariah the whole time is that it's a symbolic book about church history. It's about like the Catholic church and and all the different people and the resurrections are, I mean, and then seeing the Messiah and things like that are all symbolic events about church history. So you can see why he would have a really hard time figuring out what it's actually about because the whole time he's trying to make it symbolic for church history. I don't think we're going to have the same problem as we go through Zechariah 14. I think that uh, Zechariah 13 was a little difficult for us tonight, but as we get into 14, uh, I think that you'll think that it's very clear. So look at verse 1. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations, as when he fights on a day of battle. So what do you think he means in verse 1? He says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord, when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. The spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. Right. Right. Yeah, dividing the spoil is the good thing. That's what the winners get to do, right? You get to divide the spoil. You, you won the war. You take all the spoil. Now you divide it among yourselves. The Israelites are going to get to divide the spoil that was taken from them. So again, first the nations come, and and the nations, if this is at the end of the tribulation, the nations have already been terrible to them for a while now. So the spoil has already been taken, but now it's Israel that gets the victory. And all the things that were just taken from them, they get to be the ones that divide it among themselves. They're the winners. So a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people. And I, I think that this would be that same uh, purified people that love the Lord, that have seen him, that he refined like silver. The rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. You know, if you're adding all these things together, this is an astonishing time where the Messiah is there to fight as on a day of battle, and he has finally a people who's totally purified. Uh, they, uh, it's, a, it's a national 
ethnic Israel, a portion of, of ethnic Israel that have also all become believers in Jesus Christ and have uh, seen the one that they pierced, have believed in him and repented and received this forgiveness and been cleansed. So you have a purified people ready to wage war uh, with the Messiah against the nations. Verse four. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from the east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. So can you picture that in your mind? Messiah comes, the Lord comes to land and his feet land on Mount, the Mount of Olives. So remember, the Mount of Olives, you know, if you're looking at it, let's see how we can do this. So let's say you're standing on the Temple Mount, uh, you know, Mount Zion. The Mount of Olives is off to the east from there. So you can see on the Temple Mount, you can see the Mount of Olives. And right now it's covered in tombs and, and things like that. You can also stand on the Mount of Olives and look and see the Temple Mount. And there's a valley in between. Um, it would have been, so just to give you a little bit of context, when Jesus was on his final night, he would have started over here in Jerusalem uh, uh, for the Last Supper and, and things like that. He went over you know, through the valley up onto the Mount of Olives. That's where the Garden of Gethsemane was. Uh, and then he was taken back over here for his trial and his crucifixion. So that's Mount Zion and the Mount of Olives. So when the Messiah comes, he lands on the Mount of Olives. And can you picture that in your, in your head? It's, it's split in two from east to west. So now if you're bird's eye, like you're looking at a map, the mountain is split in two. So the split is this way. So that uh, one half of the mountain shall move northward and the other half southward. So there's a new valley. There's a new split in the mountain. The mountain's cut in half when he lands on it so that it moves in, in two different directions. Verse five, you shall flee to the valley of my mountains for the valley of the mountain shall reach to Azal and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. So we'll, we'll pick up there next time. Uh, we'll talk more about the mountain, more about the fleeing, what's going on, more about that earthquake. Uh, but for now, just try and picture that in your mind. You have a purified people. All the nations have gathered against them. Messiah comes and lands on the mountain, is ready to wage war in battle. Um, and then we're going to get to see that battle as we continue on in Zechariah 14. So I know that it's been a lot. Uh, you've done a good job holding on and trying to imagine these things in your mind. Uh, we have one more Wednesday night, uh, Lord willing, next week, where we'll have a Christmas-themed potluck, and then we'll finish the book of Zechariah uh, and uh, try and tie it all up um, as we break for the semester. Okay? Uh, let me pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us uh, as we seek to wrap our minds around this, help us understand the scriptures, help us understand the prophecies about Christ's first coming, um, and help us look forward to the fulfillment of the prophecies about Christ's return uh, as he gloriously, gloriously comes to fight for his people, as he purifies his people, as he stands ready to battle and rescue them. Uh, we look forward to that day when he rights every wrong, when, when he vindicates him, his name, when you vindicate your name, uh, when you uh, cause this righteousness that the nation of Israel has been waiting for, we pray that you'd help us long for these things in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.